Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Underdog Leadership Podcast listeners. Oh, have I got a show for you today and a woman to introduce you to. In a minute, you're going to meet Mary Sullivan, who is one of the co-founders of the podcast, wait for it, Sweet But Fearless. And so we thought it would be so appropriate to call this episode, How to Be Sweet But Fearless. And so in this episode or season two of the, the podcast, where we're talking about rebellion, we're talking about those transitions and shifts that we want to make as women, Mary is a gal you all need to meet. So um, actually, you know, Mary, I'm going to have you introduce yourself. How would you like to invite or welcome yourself to our listeners? Take it away. Well, you know, thank you so much, Jenny, and thank you to all the Underdog Leadership listeners. I'm so excited to be one of your special guests today. So I introduce myself as Irrepressible Major League Mary Sullivan. And I say it that way because I once did an exercise as a leader in my group talking about how we brand ourselves and how do we think mm -hmm. about ourselves. And we each went around the room and I thought, this is how I see myself and it was great to know this is how others saw me as well. And I thought, well, then don't be ashamed to go out and introduce yourself that way. So that's how I introduce myself. But I'm also one of the co-founders of, yes, the Sweet But Fearless podcast, our Sweet But Fearless website, and our nation. And again, so excited to be with you today. Oh, and uh, as I was preparing to introduce you, it's funny, I went back through your LinkedIn. And you know, this is a woman just for you, for context for you gals listening, who had a very senior role in multiple major banks in the States. Um, and we're going to hear more about her why and why she's passionate about this. And I also have, have said, we were just talking earlier, how many times women say, oh, I'm not going to go political here. And she and I have given ourselves permission, because this is the rebellion season, to do it and talk about it. And, and we'll, you'll hear more about that now. But I do find, Mary, women are coming out of the woodwork. Women are coming out to say, this is not acceptable. I need to be part of this conversation. Um, but before I go there, how the heck did this thing start? Like, tell, put us back to the beginning of the podcast. Where were you? Well, this fits right in with your season of rebellion because I was going to get laid off for the third time. Third time. I hope you guys hear that. Three times laid off. And yes, I had very senior level positions at multiple financial institutions. And that doesn't matter, right? It just doesn't matter if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, or frankly, as I felt the third time, I was in the right place at the right time. And that was a chance to get a wonderful package to start my own career, my own company with two of my great friends and colleagues, and really do something that I felt was beneficial more for the masses. I, I felt I was very influential as a leader, and I definitely used that privilege in order to help women and people of color get into leadership positions, get into the financial industry. And yeah. part of one of my goals was to help recruit and retain top talent in our, you know, in our company across the board. I realized if I could do that for three or four financial institutions with great success, I can certainly do that for myself and with the Sweet the Fearless Nation and provide that platform. And that's why it started. We really felt that there was this void. There was this mm -hmm. void when you're in corporate America corporate Canada or just corporate yep. in general, right? There's this void when you are a frontline leader. You don't get all the attention and love and skill building and training that you get when you are, say, a senior individual that's on the track in mm -hmm. order to get to the C-suite, right? They get the executive coaches. They get sent to Harvard they, or Stanford for executive training. They get all these wonderful perks as they should in order to prepare themselves for the C-suite. And when you first enter leadership, you get lots of training to help teach you how to be a leader, how to coach, how to avoid HR situations. <laughs> totally. How to negotiate salaries that we'll talk about. Just in general, you get a lot of that skill building. But once you're a frontline leader, and maybe yeah. you've been in your role for a couple of years, you're kind of left on your own to figure out how to get to the next senior level. So at Sweet But Fearless, we felt we could really help provide that gap analysis yeah. for you, that gap training. And that's what it's all about. We felt that we did have this gift. We did have this passion and knowledge of over what, 70 collective years of experience among yeah. all three of us in order to share with other women that maybe don't have that opportunity at their job, or maybe they're an entrepreneur and need a little help. So that's how it all started. It started during 
COVID and it also started with a little bit of rebellion, like you're saying, mm-hmm. and a little bit of a revolutionary yeah. mindset yeah. and revolution yeah. in the sense of we were a little tired. We were tired of hearing how we were underpaid. We were tired of hearing how others were getting elected into office and we know the orange man, you know, what the hell was that all about? We were just so upset about everything going on. But we also just didn't want to be someone on Twitter telling everybody in the world that we are. We wanted to do something. So we felt by really elevating Mm -hmm. other women, we could make a change. It's so interesting. Uh, You know, one of the themes of women is collaboration. And I just find it very, very telling that you chose to do it together. You each have different roles in the company or in the organization. And um, the other thing I hear, and I hear this from so many times from number twos to number ones, because there's a lot of parallels, I think, with our work, Mary. I'm really excited Mm -hmm. to talk about that is You know, we kind of, the mid-levels or whatever you call them, the ones just below the C-suite, it's so easy to get pigeonholed. It's so easy to be sort of like, oh, she's so reliable. She's going to keep doing her job. She never drops any balls. She makes everyone look good. We couldn't possibly promote her because the place would fall apart. Right, Mary? Yeah, you've heard that one before, Jenny. You know, it's, it's, or, or, wow, they're a great executor, so they yes. really can't be a visionary or strategic. And I thought, I'm an and person. I'm not an or leader. I'm an and leader. I can execute yeah. and think about the future and yeah. think about the next steps. But you're right, Jenny. So many times you, they try to pigeonhole you because why? They can't afford to lose you. That's right. They can't That's afford it. to lose you and the work you're doing. Oh, you know, it, it, it speaks a little bit to the, um, just a, a framework Excellence versus your place of genius. I don't know if you've read the uh, the Big Leap book, but the place of excellence is what people recognize you for. It's sort of the thing you're known for. Like for me, it's like, oh, Jenny, she's so organized. She can handle so many files. Oh my God, she never loses her cool. Da, 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 da. But the place of genius for me is this, is connecting in a meaningful way. Love that. And I could easily hide in my place of excellence. So maybe that's question number one for those of you listening is, is there a place you're hiding? Is there, a, is there a place you're staying comfortable because it's familiar and you know how to do it? And um, I'm going to guess, Mary, that you're a big advocate of trying out things that might be just outside your comfy zone. And you seem like a person that puts your actions behind your words as with that. You know, you hit the nail on the head. I uh, definitely got in trouble a few times, right? When we talk about taking risks. Yeah. Great rewards, and I had many, many rewards, but I also had some failures too. And yeah. a lot of them came with taking some risks. And frankly, when I look back, I'm like, I was okay with that. Mm-hmm. And as long as my boss was able, or you had someone in your camp that was able to see that that was a uh, not a lapse in judgment, but you went through all the thought process and it just wasn't the right choice or the best choice at that time, but to keep going, then you can continue to make and take those risks. And I bring that up because when you talk about that, one of the questions I know you had asked was, where was there a place where you were an underdog mm-hmm. and you had to overcome it? And I think it just comes right into play with this. And I recall this story of when I, uh, one of my highlights of my career, as well as one that I look back on when I know I have to be resilient, when I know I have to, or I'm thinking I'm in that underdog place and I've got to claw my way up and fight. And I think back and I say, I can do it because I've done it before. And the time that comes into uh, mind for me, Jenny, Mm -hmm. is I was in Stockton, California, over a branch with uh, a financial firm. And it was a branch that I was able to turn around. You know, it was like one of the last ranked branches. And I was able to build a really good team, teach them some skills, really just empower them to go do their thing and try some new things. And we became one of the top branches in our our, uh, category. So from that, an opportunity came up to take on a branch in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And I happened to be bilingual and have my master's in Spanish. And I immediately raised my hand and I said, I want that branch. And my boss was like, oh, darn. You know, I think they have in mind a male. Yeah. Probably a Hispanic male for that role, Mary. And I said, ooh, I know. I know that makes sense. I know. But just get me an interview. Get me to the yeah. interview table. And he said, yes, you've earned it. You, you know, you got me to some accolades. I'm, I'm going to help you. And so, again, one of those sponsors that pounded the table. Yes. Just say, oh, think about Mary. He said, no, I want you to put Mary in the, 
interview pool. They did. I earned the right. I interviewed well. And, you know, I, I say the word convinced because I think interviewing is about convincing. It's yep. sharing, but it's also convincing them, helping them make that decision for themselves, <laughs> right? Put yourself yeah. in the best light possible. Anyway, I got the role. And when I started down there in Puerto Rico, definitely was an underdog. I had all yeah. the pressure from the firm going, you know, don't fuck, don't mess it up. Right. Yeah. Don't, don't it's okay. We up. can swear here. We're rebellious. <laughs> you know, they were like, don't, don't F it up. You know, biggest thing. Do not put our name in the paper in a negative way. You know, we took a big risk on you. That's why I kept hearing all along. We took yeah. a big risk on you. And yeah. Number two, right? You are doing something internationally. And I know that, of course, Puerto Rico, part of the United States and all the synergy, but at the same mm -hmm. time, uh, it's just such a lovely independent country on its own that you have to respect that too. Yep. I was the only female leading a financial institution. So I also had that, right? The first, the only, you know, on my shoulder. And so going down there, being that underdog, I thought, okay, I could go in like a bull in the China closet, mm -hmm. right? say, hey, you know, I was put here for a reason. I know all yep. the answers about financial industry. Let me just, you know, explain to everybody how to do it right, how to invest with us, and you'll all be smart like me too, which we know was not the right way to do it. And I, I felt on these three things, you know, Jenna or Jenny, I said, be humble. You have to go in being humble. If you're going to be the underdog, at first you have to understand that's where you are. So be realistic and be humble about it. Why, why do I feel this way? Okay, where are my gaps? What do I need to be aware of, right? The ones I can see and the ones I can't see. Be curious. Mm. What do I need to learn? There's Love that. so much out there I didn't know. I knew nothing about Puerto Rico in the sense of truly being Puerto Rican or their history of investing or their history and culture. I read books, of course, but yeah. did I really know? No. So be curious and learn. And don't become that know-it-all. And then be fearless and then go after what you want and go after it with gumption, right? With, yeah. with a lot of fire and everything behind you, just go after it and get it and let people know I'm going to win. Yeah. This is going to be successful. It <laughs> might be a little painful <laughs> for all of us, <laughs> but yeah. I am going to win. We are going to win. The team is going to win. The firm is going to win and you're going to win. There is going to be a successful outcome. Just believe in it. And believe. those are the things, Jenny, that really, really helped me be an underdog and yeah. then come out on the other end. Again, can't say it enough with my team and with all of Puerto Rico being very successful. We helped people learn how to invest, quote, the way that yeah. we were teaching, which was a discount brokerage way, a more do-it-yourself kind of way, empowerment way versus a managed funds way. Mm -hmm. but also just created a, uh, a team of individuals that also became those passionate followers and therefore then, you know, speakers on behalf of investing. So that is my underdog story. And one, when I think about things that I'm trying new or that I'm in that underdog position, I think, nope, if I follow this process, yeah. it can have a successful outcome. And that doesn't always mean the one you thought was going to be yeah. the one at first. Right, those goalposts can move, but Jenny, it's going to be successful. And I remember, and my team will tell you, they're like, "Oh my God, Mary used to say that all the time." Oh, we're going to win. <laughs> it's going to take time, but we are going to win. <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah." I there's okay. <clears throat> there's so much in this, but first of all, if you're watching me, I am smiling from ear to ear because. Mary's energy is infectious, you guys. She has me like on tender hooks. I am rooting for her. I can only imagine what it's like to work for you, by the way, or to listen to your podcast, which we're going to get to in just in a second. Um, the other thing I think is, you know, that humility you talked about. Sometimes I think leadership is going through a change. And I love the way you talked about humility and curiosity, but attached to ambition. So, you can be humble and curious and respect the people that you're, obviously you're coming in to change things, right? Like change management. Um, there's a great episode that I had with uh, Megan Rabine about the glass cliff experience where a woman is brought in to do something that's almost impossible. And so they're given the, la they're kind of like last chance Charlie, and then they have to turn things around. And you kind of describe that with Puerto Rico a little bit. 
But what I love is never losing sight of the belief of where you want to be. It, you can't control how long it's going to take. You can't control how many staff are going to change. But that conviction of yourself and what's possible, I love the way you committed to that from, from the very beginning. And that's clear, clear in that story, Mary. Well, Jenny, yeah. we also talk about, you know, that's where sweet but fearless, right? That's totally. exactly where that comes from in the sense of you can be kind, you can be humble and still want to win and still be yeah. competitive. You know, I'm a former uh, soccer athlete in college and I always tell people there's no shame in wanting to win. And mm -hmm. it's, yes, if the other team has to lose, but that doesn't mean we all can't have fun along the way or maybe mm -hmm. we even lose <clears throat> but again, it's not yeah. that we lost the game. Maybe we lost because we didn't strategize well, or maybe we yep. just outplayed. But if you still yeah. learn something along the way, then I don't think it's a total loss. And we try to have that philosophy as well, Jenny, yeah. that, you know, you don't have to throw out everything, you know, yeah. if there's a loss, right? There, you know. And just a random thought, but how how important a debrief is right? How important a postmortem is. So many people I see just kind of throwing themselves at the next wall, throwing themselves at the next hurdle without taking a look at taking stock, Mary. I think that's really important. You know, Jenny, oh my gosh, I had the best training once <clears throat> in one of the firms about debriefing. And, and okay. I'll get a book to you about that as well. It was wonderful. And it was actually based on the military. And uh, this person was from the military. And they talked about how debriefing after a successful mm. campaign is even more important than debriefing after one where it failed, which a lot of yeah. times I think we, we do that a little bit. If we fail, we say, oh, what did we do wrong? Yeah. But a lot of times we don't say, what did we do right? And how do we repeat that process yeah. that was a winning process? So yeah. I agree, debriefing, when you think about, let's take an yeah. hour in the you know hour of time and say, how much time should you spend on things? I think a lot of people think, oh, well, you should spend, you know, 40 of those minutes, 50 of those minutes executing. And no, right. no, no, no. You should spend 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes strategizing, thinking through, declaring your plan, et cetera, yeah. right? Calibrating, collaborating, doing all of that. Yeah. You should only spend... 15 or so executing and the rest debriefing, right? If you yeah. do all of this effort up front about strategizing, then the execution is quick and easy and flawless. But if you skip the step of the strategizing and you skip the step of the debriefing, then you just find yourself having to repeat over and over your mistakes. I mean, that is definitely oh, Mary. in life. <laughs> So that nugget, folks listening, is so golden and so much been my experience. I mean, I work as a consultant, right? And it's like they hire you, you you basically create space for them to build a good strategy and then everything rolls, right? This is this is golden. This is so so interesting. Okay. I want to shift gears a little bit because I have a woman in with a finance background on the Underdog Leadership Podcast. So I I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the topic of women and money. Oh. So my position is that money is a tool. I work in fundraising as well, just I'm an executive coach, but I also have a lot of clients and not-for-profit where fundraising is really scary. Um, hopefully they, when they work with me, they don't feel that way and they don't feel like it's going to the dentist. Hopefully they find fundraising is actually incredibly, I see fundraising and money as, as, a, as trust. So when I give you my fundraising money, it's because I trust you and I want to see change happen in the world. But let's back up a minute. So many women see money as, um, I don't know, like a black hole, an unknown. Could you like encapsulate your, your theories, your beliefs about why women need to care deeply about money? I definitely can, Jenny. And I'm also going to tie it into the art of negotiation. Love and it. I'm going to do it for this reason. And that is that when we talk about negotiating and we talk about money, to me, they're intertwined. And they're intertwined because there's both short-term cost and long-term cost to doing the lack of each one. The lack of investing, mm -hmm. right? And the lack of negotiating. So I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably. You guys bear with me, there's a reason. And okay. first of all, we have an emotional attachment to money, right? The Your first instinct, Let's say when you're negotiating is to say, oh my God, thank you. Yes, I'll take it. I'll take it. Yes, I'm, I'm happy, you know, 
And then you think afterward, darn, I should have asked for more. I should have asked for more. It's the same thing with investing, right? You start investing a little bit and then you think, oh my gosh, I, I did well, right? The last five years or whatever, there were good years. And I'm talking about any time period because there's always good and bad years. And you think, oh, I should have invested more. So yes, in both cases, start up front by putting in all that you can. Put in hmm. all that you can in your effort in negotiating. Ask for everything you want. Make your list, do your homework, be prepared, do your research, ask others, go to Glassdoor, go to Indeed, wherever you can to get the information. And now with laws being passed to make pay transparent, there's a lot more information. No reason we shouldn't be informed. No reason. They can reach out to a coach just like you, Jenny, and get some information on how to negotiate better. I've seen women leave thousands of dollars at the table. If you take that money and do a future value, and everybody can do that on, on, you know, the Google machine, I call it, you know, you can go to the internet and just type in future value of $10,000 over 15, 20 years, you have left a lot of money on the table. And that's money you could have invested. That's money that goes to our savings and our quality of life as women when we're older, which is how this is all intertwined. It's the same thing about investing. I think a lot Mm -hmm. of times as women, we care for others. And we're always looking out for someone else. Sometimes we forget to look out for ourselves. And I'm a big proponent of pay yourself first. Pay yourself first. I know you hear it from all sorts of financial institutions, but truly, ladies, do it. Pay yourself first. Put it in your retirement account. Put it in an IRA account, savings account, somewhere. Pay yourself first. You truly can live off of a different budget if you start that way. It's a little bit harder to take home the money, put it in your account, and then take it out and go do something. Mm-hmm. That's a little well, hard. I want to mm-hmm. interrupt for a sec, too, because I think it was you that said, because a lot of us up here are, and, and, you know, the terms might be different in Canada and the States, but, you know, the tax-sheltered account for yourself versus <laughs> the tax-sheltered account for your kid's education. And go ahead and say it, because I think this is brilliant, Mary. It, it's very true. You can do it all. But first, pay for yourself. First, take care of yourself. Make sure you have the money that you need as a woman in order to be thriving in your life, in order to be comfortable, or even in order to just get by wherever you are, whatever stage you are, you have to invest with yourself first. Definitely then you can put in for college savings for children or investment plans for others. Parents, maybe you have to take care of long-term care for your parents, but- Always take care of yourself first. And the reason that's intertwined, Jenny, the whole investing is with negotiating is the fact that a lot of times people say, I don't have any extra money. You do. Go get some more money, but either it's a side hustle or Mm -hmm. demand more for your salary. You're probably underpaid anyway. We already know it's 82 cents on the dollar or less if you're a woman of color. So there's a little more money on the table. Go get it. And when you do get that extra money, invest it because you were already yeah. living on a different budget, right? So this is all about women starting soon, being consistent, yeah. and really taking care of themselves first. That is my golden gems on investing. And there's so many women advisors out there, so many women who would help you in investing. If you feel more comfortable investing with women, invest with whomever yeah. you feel comfortable with. But my yeah. main thing is get started. There's, there, there's, this has been my journey and uh, I'm so glad you said it out loud. And half of you listening are like physically writhing from the idea that we would pay for pay ourselves before we put money in our kids' accounts. I know that one I had a really tough time with initially, Mary, but here's the truth. If you aren't standing on your own two financial feet, how the hell, and I mean, in a, I am in a very healthy, very positive I am incredibly lucky relationship just to just to like, this is not single Jenny here. This is married Jenny with a very supportive husband who takes care of us. Um, but what I realized along the way is that I didn't have eyes on my wealth. I had eyes on my day to day, Mary, but I didn't have eyes on my yeah, wealth sure and my can. assets long term. Right. And when I realized that I have done, a, also I'm an alchemist, which is my money archetype, which basically means that I don't believe in, I hate the fact that we have to have money. 
I believe money has power, but I have this weird love hate relationship. So one of my actions was just to speak to your action point is I said, I need to get more financially literate. And I took a, a women's investing course. I started to, I found a, a women's group to talk about money because I knew as hell as anything, I was never going to read the book, Mary. I was not going to read the Globe Mail on the business side. So I found a bunch of women I could visit with every Sunday night. And I say visit because I go because of them. I don't go because we're going to talk about Rio Tinto, right? but I, I do enjoy the conversation and I am learning. And you know what the hardest part about this was for me is I sucked at it. Like I was, I didn't know anything about it. It was really hard for accomplished professional Jenny to put her hand up and say, I need help. And I know nothing about this. Jenny, you know, more people spend time planning a vacation than planning <laughs> their investing and their savings in their retirement. And, and that is a sad fact, yeah. but it yeah. is also because of that very reason, Jamie, that yeah. I afraid to admit that we don't know something, right? Like you said, you know, degrees here, accomplishments here, totally money in the bank. Don't know where it really comes from. Don't know really where it goes. Don't know really where it's going to be. And I love how you found your nation of supportive women and mm -hmm. others to talk about. And I hope women hear that and do that because, I mean, we have free wealth building workshops. We have free financial literacy. Great. We do that all the time. Just so you know, anybody who wants free financial literacy, please, please let me know. Happy to share with you. We teach people how to get started, whether it's a dollar, literally, or a thousand dollars. It's just about yeah. getting started and finding ways to invest and then becoming educated on what's going on in our economies, right? The world economy, your local economy, and where you can really uh, make a difference. I, I know you mentioned being married and having that trusted partner, and that's phenomenal. I've been single all my life, and part of my you know, passion was, and my push was, I'm going to mm -hmm. make sure I can take care of my son. I'm going to make sure I don't have to rely on someone else. If I meet someone phenomenal, that would be great, but I'm not mm -hmm. going to depend on them financially. Mm -hmm. I need to make mm -hmm. sure I can stand on my own and even higher and help others. And that's yeah. definitely, you know, also part of the reason Sweet But Fearless, as we said, women need not only to be educated about their career journey, but their financial journey as well. Yeah their financial journey. It's reminding me of my, um, and you know, that I think it's so appropriate that you and I are one very happily and, and contentedly married and one very single and contentedly single person, okay. regardless of who you are, if you are listening to this podcast and the, I, the word investment scares you or the word investment makes you go put your head under a pillow, um, this is a wake up call. Like Mary is an action gal. She's going to come find you. And she's yeah. going to tell you to get your head out from under that pillow and, and go, go get, get some information. And you know, the information to your point, it doesn't cost a lot to go and book an appointment with the banker or mm -hmm. I think information is knowledge. And I had a friend in university to say, there's no risk to data collection. Exactly. And I kind of like that. It's like, like collecting that. information doesn't cost you anything. Right, Mary? I'm writing <laughs> that smart. Yeah, there yeah. is to data collection. I yeah. love it. You know, and, it, and I think, yeah. we, you know, we think about, you know, because finance is so personal, but mm -hmm. I just want to also leave them with saying every missed dollar earned and saved is, has a long, long term impact on your quality of life uh, down the road. And just want to make sure of that. It's, I don't care if you're 30. I don't care if you're 60. It's never too late to start. So I want to put that in numbers for us because I think a lot of people go, uh, okay, so let's just really say, so we're, we're 40, we're negotiating our first VP job, right? Or whatever. Let's just make easy math because my I'm not good at math. 100,000. 100, I shouldn't say that. I'm working on my math skills, especially for an inspirational podcast. I really need to say that. So the salary is $100,000 and they're offering you that. Let's put it in real terms. Um, the negotiation on your, for us, it's RRSPs. I don't know, probably a SEP IRA or I'm not quite sure what it's called, yeah. but the pension part that your company invests in for you. The difference between 5% and 4% on that investment annually. So 5% of 100,000 would be $5,000. Am I right? Correct. I did math right? Yep. Okay. Yep, you did so it. the difference between 5% and 3% is like 2% a year. Who gives a whoopty flip, right? On paper. But year over year over year, make it 10 years, Mary, at 
let's call it 5%. I can't do that math, but I know for a fact it compounded over 10 years. That's probably somewhere in the $40,000 range, I'm going to guess. Yes, and you're guessing correctly, Jenny, but we have done the studies to show that just a bare 2 to 3% difference can really make anywhere between forty and $80,000 difference down the road. I mean, this is so impactful. And this is why we talk about the art of negotiation. We talk about asking for what you deserve. And yeah. we talk about, you know, really doing it sooner than later so that that money can compound. Because I know, you know, again, yeah. I would need a yeah. calculator to do. Compound. Yeah, me too. But you do the simple math, which you did, right? 5,000 a year times X amount of years. And then you add a little extra for the compounding. But I'm going to tell you guys that little extra for compounding is huge. Mm -hmm. Is huge. And that's why we talk about starting early. And we know, Jenny, that the thought of negotiating can be very, can bring a lot of fear to women. It can bring anxiety for all sorts of reasons, emotionally, socially, all sorts of reasons that people shy away from negotiating. Yeah. But I know you have, and I have many techniques that really help individuals kind of take out that fear and put in place some clarity and some confidence so that they yeah. really go in with knowledge. And it's not about demanding. I think a lot of people, no. negotiators, you're no. demanding. I'm like, frankly, I've really never had to ask. I just present the data so clearly. They're like, here you go, Mary, here's the money. Yeah. Because yeah. I presented it well. And I've learned that yeah. through practice and through listening yeah. to others, how to present options to individuals so that everybody wins, everybody saves space and everybody can move forward. Because negotiating isn't about one and done. And I also want to leave that with your listeners, you know, for the underdog group. This is not about one time you go out and negotiate and you win. It's about part becomes part of your nature and how you interact and what your expectations are, how you have to have higher expectations than as women we probably have for ourselves right now. So, so a couple of really, this is such a great, there's so much in this. I love what you said about not one and done. I think that's so true. I believe a lot of money issues are self-worth issues. Yeah. So having your own sense of self-worth and this idea that I'm supposed to go to the table and fight. I think some of the language is wrong around negotiation. We have mm -hmm. such a male approach to negotiation that it's all about like grabbing the biggest um, water buffalo and taking it for our family, like on a, on a sort of primal level. Yeah. And really what this is about is making sure that both sides needs are met. That's a woman's way of saying it and that our needs are met and that what we have, we are happy with, not that we're settling for it right. because somebody else needs the piece of the pie more than another. Let's, for, let's not forget in the fifties, they would have a man come back to his job Verse and remove the woman from that position because he needed to take care of a family and women were not seen that way. That is not the case anymore. The probability that a woman is taking care of her family through her salary is much greater. And so when you give away your piece of the, or when you don't discuss how the piece of your pie is going to make a difference in your life and talk about how we can mutually benefit from that negotiation, there's a huge loss on an empowerment level as well as a financial level. You know, Jenny, you, you said it so well, and I'm going to yeah. add to that, that a lot yeah. of times we do look at it just like in politics. We look at it as there's a pie. And if I give you a piece, I get yeah. less of the pie. And yeah. Negotiating is so broader than that. It's about making the pie bigger. It's uh -huh. about saying, I don't, just because you get something does not mean that I don't get something as well, or that it has to be even equal parts. Let's make the pie bigger, make different kinds of pies, all sorts of things you can do when you're talking about negotiating. Mm -hmm. And it is all about thinking through creative options. Earlier when we talked about that curiosity, mm -hmm. That's always helped with the negotiation because a lot of times mm -hmm. people think you're only negotiating the base salary or you're only negotiating a sign-on bonus or benefits, mm -hmm. whatever it is that you're negotiating. And when we talk about making the pie bigger, we say, bring in other things, make your list, do your research. What are all the things that you want? Go to your wish list. This is mm -hmm. your time. This is not the time to say, I'm only going to ask for what I think they'll say yes to. Yeah. Now, I make it easy for them to say yes, 
but I'm going to ask for everything I want. Because a and new then, part of negotiation and then, is you're probably going to get 85% of it. Yeah. And, you know, you never know. There's something here about, like, you know, in fundraising, it's the same, right? The same They're allowed right. to say no, Mary. They're allowed to say, no, I can't do that. But to not put it on the table is really kind of a, a missed opportunity, isn't it? Well, we think a lot of times if we ask for it, they're almost going to be so upset that they're going to take away the job mm -hmm. offer. I mean, that is truly a fear that people yeah. have. And I'm like, that is, does not happen. Do you know that 85% yeah. of recruiters expect you to ask for money? And kind of probably say, hmm, why didn't they ask for more money? Why didn't they negotiate? Huh. On the flip side, they probably think a little less of your skills for not yeah. negotiating. Because 85% yeah. of them expect you to negotiate. They expect you to ask for more. <laughs> ask for more. You're leaving it on the table. All they could say, like I said, what's the worst thing is they say no. And then you figure out, okay, am I ready to, yeah. right? Figure out your BATNA, the best alternative to the negotiated solution. Am I going to say yes? Am I going to take it? Am I going to be okay with it or not? Yeah. You know, and the, it's funny. the say negotiations, don't do the ultimatums unless you are ready no. to walk. Unless you're ready yes. to do it. That's not how you start. That may be how it ends yeah. down the road if you yeah. are a very disgruntled employee and just have had enough. But that's not where you start. That's not negotiating. Yeah. Oh, 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 gosh. Yes. And, you know, it's funny to kind of dive into negotiation as a topic, too. I have the story that's coming up and then I want to close and I want to make sure I give you a chance to to share how people can can, can get more merry in their lives. I was last night, my daughter was buying an iPad and making a decision about an iPad for school, which she wants to take notes on and whatever. And it was funny because she's 18. So she's looking to me to, to make the decision for her. And I walked into the store, Mary, with a very purposeful intent that it was her decision to make. It was her money. And I thought, this is the beginning of a whole trajectory of decisions that you're going to make. Right. And I want you to make the decision because I want you to enjoy the happiness of your own decision too, right? So that's the flip right. side of negotiation is when you, when you finally do decide what you're willing to negotiate, you own it, you make choices. And you know, this whole podcast really is about making choices and living with them and being happy with the choices you made. I honestly think sometimes I have this car that was given to me by my dad and I love him to death and he's wonderful. And it was such a generous gesture, but because I didn't pick it, Mary, I've never liked the car, right? So I got to deal with that. That's another podcast itself, but it's like that was an opportunity for my daughter to start on that path, that journey. What did you call it? There was like a continuum of, of life skills and a continuum of financial literacy and competency that you're such a great advocate for. Ugh. Oh, well, Jenny, I think your daughter is very fortunate. I love that. I've written that down as well. Enjoy the happiness of your decision. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I'm definitely going to be adding that to Own our it. repertoire. Thank you. Yes, Thank 100%. you so much for having me. Oh, well, I, I, this has been, there's so many pieces that we touched on today. Mary, people want more Mary in their life. How do they find you? Tell us more. Another thing I'm going to add, I thought, oh, that's a great thing. Be more Mary. M-E-R-R-Y, M-A-R-Y. Yeah, be more Mary. Be more Mary. Uh, definitely, I would love you guys come on over and visit sweetbutfearless.com. Sweetbutfearless, all one word, dot com. On our website, we have some wonderful blogs. You're free to download them, use them. Great storytelling and excerpts on different leadership skills and soft skills and how you can apply them in your life, as well as access to our podcast by the same name, Sweet But Fearless. But one thing we're really showcasing is our, our monthly membership, our Career okay. Transformation Academy. And it's a very, very inexpensive way, $29 a month, where someone can join and get a lot of access to videos, PDFs, and monthly coaching in order to keep some skill building going or to add some new skills. Sometimes you just want to come in and say, hey, I got some feedback on my last review. I need to work on my communication. You can come into the academy and be really pinpointed and get yeah. information on communication. Or maybe you're saying, I need to start overall broad and then go uh, very uh, specific. We can help you with that too. But that's mm -hmm. how you can get more Mary because I'm very involved in all of that. And as you said, Jenny, just love being passionate about helping mm -hmm. women, helping underdogs, helping women two to one, 
um, three to two. I, I don't care where you are. <laughs> five to five to four. Five to four. <laughs> even if you want to take a step back, right? Five yeah. to six, and you know, take yourself out of some of the uh, yeah. higher anxiety jobs and take a step back in order to do more other, you know, and to add other things in your life. Wherever you are, we really try to help you on your career transformation journey. And that's one of the things oh. we do. So, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Mary, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your knowledge. I think you have a unique background to speak the way you do. And um, I know from sitting behind this microphone, it's been incredibly inspirational. And just for context, Mary got up at like 6.30 on the West Coast to do this interview. So she's if she's like this at 6.30 in the morning, folks, she I can only imagine what she's like at 9. <laughs> <laughs> at 9 a.m., but let me tell you, it stops around 4 or 5 in the evening. <laughs> it, it, Fair it, enough. It, it hits that cliff and goes down, Jenny. And I also want to let Jenny's listeners know that Jenny yeah. has graciously volunteered to be a guest on my podcast. So yeah. I'm so excited. And we'll be sharing with all of you when that episode airs as well. So that's yeah. Women Helping Women. And I love That's it. right. I love That's it. 100% it. So uh, with that, I want to say thanks everyone for listening. And maybe the, the inspiration here is go lift someone up. If you come into the office today and you see someone that, that leaves a little lifting or a bit of more attention or a bit of connection, find them, lift them up, uh, enjoy them and uh, make it a great day, everyone. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.